as we uh, move into our next presentation, the uh, presenter will be Lawson Klein. He's another uh, Omnex consultant. Lawson's experience includes 15 years of uh, progressive, responsible uh, manufacturing, engineering, and management roles in medical device contracting industry, followed by 20 years of uh, uh, progressively responsible roles in quality engineering and management. Uh, Lawson currently provides instructions for uh, uh, auditors and implementers of uh, ISO 13485, uh, ISO 14971, and MedSAP. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Lawson. Right. Well, thank you very much there, Mike. Uh, that introduction. Uh, we started here talking about a little bit of cybersecurity and the IMDRF. The IMDRF is also known as the International Medical Device Regulators Forum, and it's a voluntary group of medical device regulators from around the world formed in uh, 2011 to build on the strong foundational work of the GHTF, the Global Harmonization Task Force on Medical uh, Devices. They are the GHTF. So the acronyms uh, can catch up with you. I'll try to repeat them so we have a little bit of better uh, background about that. GHTF, again, Global Harmonization Task Force. Um, and they worked on the same uh, before uh, the IMDRF. Uh, up until about 2011, um, and they wanted to accelerate the International Medical Device Regulatory Harmonization and Convergence is their purpose. So there's recent changes to 1345, and it involved a goal, and the goal was to provide an easily understood QMS uh, standard that is designed for regulatory purposes. And then uh, what we refer to now as MedSAP was kind of created. And the MedSAP document, uh, the Medical Device Single Audit Program, uh, that document provides a common set of requirements that include the life cycle of product in the scope, and includes software and cybersecurity considerations within it, and updates some of the requirements, current best practices based on uh, the ancient, uh, not quite ancient, but older GHTF documents. Now a little bit more on GHTF, the Global Harmonization Task Force was a voluntary group of uh, representatives and national medical device regulatory authorities uh, in various different uh, jurisdictions, uh, and such as the US FDA, US FDA here in the United States and members of the medical device industry too, um, whose uh, goal was to uh, standardize the med device regulation. Now the GHDF, like I said before, was disbanded in 2011 or 12, or two, I can't remember exactly the year it was, but uh, it was replaced by IMDRF. So now the IMDRF actually endeavors to modify the work of GH, GHTF uh, to better align with uh, med, med device uh, requirements over in the EU and uh, their, with their uh, medical device directive needs there. Support the medical device single audit program, uh, MedSAP, uh, the changes that were made to 2016, 1345, 2016 were with this MedSAP in mind, and it would, it would incorporate risk based decisions and principles throughout uh, the QMS. Now, uh, while uh, MedSAP is considered guidance, it's also a requirement for the auditing organizations performing regulatory audits of med device organizations, quality management systems. So that means they must use MedSAP to do those the certification audits. Uh, you can see the website listed here. Uh, right here, these documents, uh, when needed, can be found at uh, that site. So quick jot that down, you can. Um, and there's a, a, a whole bunch of different documents there where the IMDRF uh, offers guidance. Uh, uh, we'll talk more about that as we uh, um, just just as a, 
uh, give, me, give you a flavor of one of the documents that IMDRF uh, created as guidance. This came out in 2020. Uh, it, is the, it is a final document of theirs. It's titled The Principles and Practices uh, for Medical Device Cybersecurity, um, dated 18 March 2020. Um, it has a typical uh, table of contents, which includes an introduction scope, uh, the uh, definitions that go into the cybersecurity of med devices, uh, general principles, including uh, global harmonization, which is one of their primary goals, targets as they do these. Uh, and uh, in paragraph five, or clause five of their uh, document, they talk about pre-market considerations for cybersecurity of medical devices. Um, and then they go on to talk about uh, the documentation required. Um, and then in 6.0, they talk about post-market cybersecurity uh, considerations for medical devices and information sharing and things like that. They talked then about uh, vulnerability remediation, incident response, a lot like what we heard uh, from uh, Chad in our earlier presentation. So again, that is uh, Principles and Practices for Medical Device Cybersecurity, and you can find that at that, uh, that site that's listed on that slide. Okay, so uh, the uh, MedSAP documents provide a common set of requirements, and these requirements to be utilized by the regulatory authorities for recognition and monitoring uh, of entities that perform regulatory audits and other uh, related functions. So, and uh, now some jurisdictions involved in MedSAP refer to this process as designation, uh, notification, registration, or accreditation. And the jurisdictions involved in MedSAP currently are the United States, Japan, Brazil, Canada, and Australia. And the goal of MedSAP is to, to support the global convergence of regulatory systems where possible. So we have uh, two or three or four, what is it, five of the big uh, players in med device uh, all uh, using the MedSAP uh, auditing process uh, there in their uh, particular jurisdictions. Regulatory authorities may add additional requirements beyond that document when their uh, legislation requires such additions. Uh, there, are, there are other ancillary documents that uh, some jurisdictions will require, and auditors must know what those are. And it just so happens that MedSAP lists those documents, and they're uh, easily uh, determined uh, if you go through the MedSAP document and you see what it is. Um, to avoid confusion between audits of manufacturers by organizations and audits of organizations performed by medical device regulatory authorities, the latter is designated as an assessment. All right, so GHTF historically provide, provided uh, guidance to med device uh, manufacturers. And process validation, I think, is worth talking about here because process validation has become a heightened, uh, become a topic of heightened uh, uh, interest uh, to auditors and device manufacturers alike since uh, inspectors uh, look closely at this when evaluating manufacturers. Uh, it is one of the areas that 483s are commonly written, and form uh, FDA 483 is issued to firm management at the conclusion of an inspection when investigators have observed conditions that, in their judgment, do not meet the uh, requirements of the U.S. Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act that we talked about earlier, CFR 21, uh, Part 820. And there are others, but the FDA inspectors will focus their attention on this main part of the regulations for uh, these sorts of uh, uh, inspections. Um, now, a good deal of work was done by GHTF to forge ahead with this process validation guidance work, which, when done carefully uh, and well, should assure that product produced a high level or degree of confidence. It also allows device organizations to, when appropriate, uh, reduce product inspections uh, and the costs that go along with them. So. There is benefits to doing process validation. Uh, you can imagine that when you're doing 100% inspection, you can reduce that to a, a sample basis. 
uh, what your uh, inspection costs look like before and after. So what is uh, cyber security? Um, cyber security refers to the practices and technology used to protect networks and devices uh, for our purposes today. And uh, we're, we're gonna talk about this as the IOMT, that's the Internet of Medical Things, as opposed to just the IOT, Internet of Things. And so some of the things that we need to do uh, is prevent unauthorized access to documents uh, in, in the various systems on our networks. Uh, we need to prevent the theft of sensitive data. We need to uh, uh, prevent the compromise of patient safety. We don't want people getting hurt. Uh, we don't want uh, any disruption of critical services. We heard them talk about ransomware attacks. These are things that we have to avoid and prevent. Uh, we have to do uh, identity theft prevention. We have to do. We have to prevent the loss of jobs and any other of these things that we can think of. So it is also useful to know that uh, software itself accounted for 24% of recalls of med devices last year in 2022. So now we can touch on some of the protection complications of medical devices. And uh, so firstly, um, other than the whole of the software which require patches of firmware, such as EEPROM or EEPROM, these all need to be considered as software, right? Because we program them or they get reprogrammed as we use them. Uh, number two, the radio spectrum is wide open to hackers, often referred to as man in the middle, okay, and where they can access the, these devices. So that's, that's a weakness of, uh, of our RF world. We talked earlier about uh, the, the Bluetooth technology and things like that. Uh, software that has not been updated for five years is particular, particularly vulnerable, uh, five years or more, that is. Um, devices where there's no patches applied. Sometimes software can't be patched up, um, so that it remains vulnerable. Maybe need to be recreated at that rate. Um, the devices have only basic security features. They're also vulnerable. And of course, uh, as you know, there's others uh, in that. So earlier we talked a little bit about the uh, requirements in uh, in the uh, Act uh, and, and their Section 524B, it talks about ensuring cybersecurity of devices. And in general, a person who submits these uh, applications for 510K or uh, pre-market approvals and the various other uh, sections there for a device that meets the definition of cyber device under this section shall include the information secretary required to ensure that cybersecurity or cyber device meets cybersecurity requirements. Uh, found in the other articles. So the uh, the act itself requires cybersecurity uh, requirements be met. Okay, so be aware of that it's uh, Section 524B. Um, so we're not going to go through an exhaustive uh, review of what those requirements are, but we want and I want you to be aware of a couple different things. Cyber manufacturers is responsible. Uh, this, the device manufacturer that is is responsible to test and assure that the device, the cyber device, if it falls under that definition now, uh, it complies with the regulation. Okay, and then that device manufacturer shall provide reasonable assurance that the uh, device and related systems, including any software, are cyber secure. Those two things are, are pretty key. Uh, so there's other standards. We talked a little bit about 62304 right just before in our in our last in our last uh, discussion. And software is being an integral part of medical device technology to establish safety and effectiveness of the medical device containing the software. And it requires knowledge on a part of the design folk, things like that within the organization of what software is intended to do, and a demonstration of use of software fulfills the intentions without causing any unacceptable risks. Now, cybersecurity is one of those risks that shall be evaluated and minimized to acceptable levels. And in 14971, it was developed uh, to guide medical device manufacturers in their mandated task of requiring uh, risk management throughout their QMS. Okay, so in 13485, what do we do? We apply risk management uh, to everything that we do. So that's another reason that cybersecurity uh, gets kind of 
glued into our uh, requirements. Uh, we, we have software and there's cybersecurity risks with software, therefore it's a risk and it, that's how it falls under there and becomes uh, one of the things that we have to take a look at and make sure uh, we have uh, things secured. Uh, so risk is defined, just so you're aware, um, as a combination of probability of occurrence of harm and the severity of that harm. Talked a little bit about off-the-shelf software earlier. I don't think I'm going to go into this in any great detail, uh, but this also, the, the things that are worth knowing here are that this software has to be validated just like any other software that you would use. If you develop software for your device uh, on, a, on, a, on a customized basis and develop your own code, that's going to be validated. Uh, anything that you buy that's off the shelf has to be validated just the same way, like your ERP systems and things like that. Yeah, 62304 has a whole section on Okay, so that's that's covered there. All right. Um, so the CDRH recommends the least burdensome approach to do that, right? And they, they look at regulations and scientific requirements might allow the device manufacturers to more easily comply with that uh, requirement. And they're interested, the Centers for Disease Control are, 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 and radiological health are interested in feedback from manufacturers if you found an alternative approach uh, that might be less burdensome. Okay, so uh, it's time to reach out if you think you have one. Um, and so uh, we talked about the validation of this. I don't have to cover that. Um, so then we talk about the FDA's role here in the United States uh, in uh, cybersecurity. Medical devices are becoming um, more digitally interconnected and interoperable. Uh, they can improve patients' uh, care and the care that they receive and create efficiencies in the healthcare system. And med devices like computer systems are vulnerable to security breaches and potentially impact the safety and effectiveness of the device. By carefully considering the possible cybersecurity risks when designing med devices, we have a plan to manage emerging cybersecurity risks for manufacturers and they can reduce the cybersecurity risk posed by devices and patients by watching those things vigilantly. The FDA has published pre-market post-market guidance just like the IMDRF did. So if you look at those two documents, they look a lot alike. Um, and it, you know, once the once the act was uh, imposed on our great nation here, uh, then the, the FDA followed suit and put their uh, information together and guidance for that. So there's some myths that we that we must talk about here um, with cybersecurity and the FDA. And one of them is that the FDA is the only federal uh, government agency responsible for cybersecurity of medical devices. Uh, the facts are here that the FDA works closely with several different uh, government agencies, including uh, Homeland Security, uh, members of private sector uh, and med device manufacturers alike. They talk to healthcare delivery organizations and security researchers and the end users in, in, to increase the uh, security of U.S. critical cyber uh, infrastructure. So another myth here is that medical device manufacturers can't update medical devices for cybersecurity. Only the contrary is true. Medical device manufacturers can always update medical devices for cybersecurity. In fact, the FDA doesn't typically need to review changes made to medical devices solely to strengthen cybersecurity. Another myth is that the FDA is responsible for validation of software changes made to address cybersecurity vulnerabilities. Facts here are that the medical device manufacturer is responsible for validation of the software design changes, including computer software changes. And uh, any cybersecurity vulnerabilities that they know about uh, or ones that they can envision becoming problems. <clears throat> so the FDA uh, rendered guidance uh, issued September 27, 2023. Some key takeaways um, is that cybersecurity is part of device safety and quality system regulation where uh, device manufacturers must establish and follow quality systems to help ensure 
their products consistently, consistently meet applicable uh, requirements and specifications, and some of those we already talked about. Uh, a secure product development framework, or SPDF, I always talked about that too just a few minutes ago. Uh, this, this thing encompasses all the, the processes uh, required to develop that product, including the, uh, the design and development uh, all the way through decommissioning. We're going to look at the next slide for the uh, guidance document. And the guidance document appears here. Um, another key takeaway, though, is that design for security of these uh, have to be done with those objectives that we reviewed earlier. Authenticity, which includes integrity, authorization, availability, confidentiality, secure and timely updatability, and patchability. Right? So security objectives above generally may apply broadly to these devices within the scope, but you know it's not that they're limited to that, so keep that in mind. It also includes the AI and ML cloud-based sort of uh, services. We have another key takeaway, I think, and that's transparency, right? It's important for device users to have access to information pertaining to devices, uh, cybersecurity controls, the potential risks of the medical device system, and other relevant information. For example, failure to disclose all communication interfaces to third-party software that might convey potential sources of risk. I mean, listen, if I have a, a, a pacemaker in, in my body providing uh, pulses to my heart, keeping it beating well, that could potentially uh, be breached, and, and, and let's say it has a defibrillator built into it. Um, I know people that have these. I, I would sooner not be shocked here if I was doing this presentation and, and, and then you know just kind of go, uh, wheels up. So these are the things we have to be uh, making our patients aware of uh, before we ever go out and, and use them uh, with them. Uh, labeling does not include sufficient information, right? So we need to make sure that we label things with, with uh, information to explain how securely how to securely configure and update the device. Uh, and all of these devices, uh, as they require patches, uh, would have to be updated. Uh, another key takeaway is about submission documentation. Uh, device cybersecurity designs and documentation are expected to scale with the risk of that device, right? So as cybersecurity uh, concerns are elevated or rise, the amount of uh, work that you do to uh, mitigate those risks uh, goes up and uh, increases. For example, a, a risk of assessment performed by a simple non-connected uh, thermometer might conclude that the risks there are very low at a minimum, and therefore uh, needs minimum uh, security architecture. While one that uh, interfaces to the web uh, somehow or the internet uh, might need a lot more because it's accessible by uh, hackers and bad actors alike. All right, so we talked about the uh, S-bomb at length uh, earlier, so I'm not gonna go into that. Um, and we also talked about the SPDF. So, um, who to talk about with that? We covered that earlier. Now, there's, you know, as I end this a uh, little bit of presentation we've got, I want you to be aware there's a whole host of guidance on documents of various websites on the Internet of Things and even perhaps on the internet of medical things. Uh, but most of these guidance documents are free of charge, especially those from the IMDRF. And the FDA has another source, they're another source uh, with a keen eye toward the regulations. And uh, obviously in some cases will help the manufacturer uh, navigate regulation in perhaps a less painful way. So. Uh, with that, I'm going to wrap up here with this part of the presentation. I hope everybody that's still with us here has a good day. Uh, we'll see you next time.